Participate, engage, speak out, use your voice to be an effective advocate. The Voices in Advocacy podcast examines the diverse landscape of advocacy, exploring the ins and outs of building influence, driving change, and creating champion advocates. It's now time for the Voices in Advocacy podcast with your host, Roger Rickard. Hello, and I hope you are enjoying season three of the Voices in Advocacy podcast. I'm Roger Rickard, president and founder of Voices in Advocacy, where we work with organizations to inspire, educate, engage, and activate your supporters by turning them into effective, influential advocates. And this is the podcast dedicated to the art of advocacy. This podcast is for the people that work and engage in advocacy efforts for their organizations, be they corporations, associations, trade organizations, and nonprofit cause groups. Now, let's get started. On today's show, I'm pleased to say we're going to be speaking with John Hoffman, the newly appointed Senior Director of Government Affairs for Food Allergy Research and Education, known as FAIR, where he has served since 2016. Little hint here, folks, he just got an ace promotion. Congratulations. So he brings 10 years of experience in the digital advocacy realm, leading campaigns and utilizing new media to motivate and direct advocates to make their voices heard with legislators and regulators. He leads federal lobbying uh, in the House of Representatives for the organization, uh, and previously, John worked at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society as the Senior Manager in Advocacy Development. He is a fellow podcaster, so this will be easy here today. Uh, and John, as John co-hosts, uh, maybe even con-hosts, <laughs> the uh, RFK Refugees, a podcast focused on professional soccer in the Washington, D.C. area. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome to today's show, John Hoffman. John, welcome. Roger, thank you. This is a much better intro than my co-host gives me every week when we do our podcast. I like this a lot better. Well, you can share this with them and then maybe, uh, maybe we can up the fare there for you. I agree. Huh? Thanks for having me on. Oh, well, it's wonderful. Thanks for being on. Tell tell people about the mission of FAIR. Sure. Yeah. So FAIR is the world's largest uh, non-governmental organization focused on life-threatening food allergies. So there are 32 million Americans that suffer from a life-threatening food allergy. Uh, and 85 million Americans that have uh, a connection to an allergy or an intolerance. So uh, we use that number sort of look at uh, who are the people that are uh, in some way restricted or make choices in their life or have to avoid certain things because of food allergies. And the numbers is large. So uh, FAIR focuses on those on those folks trying to make their lives better through research, advocacy on the federal level, uh, and then also providing support from newly diagnosed uh, you know, to, through the school process, to going to college, to being an adult, uh, all the things, all, 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 along, all along the way, the journey for, for food allergy uh, suffers, we are, we are there for them at, with FAIR. So is it exclusively for patients or because you're doing research, are you tying together other stakeholder groups within FAIR? Yeah, no, uh, for sure. Uh, I think because of the fact that we are the largest funder of research, there's, there's lots of different stakeholders internally. Uh, people have different reasons for being attached to fair either being on our email list or being advocates it's you know a personal engagement or a professional linkage either through uh the food being in the food industry there you know there's lots of groups within uh the, the food industry that are interested in trying to figure out a way to get rid of food allergies because if less food allergies were to occur everyone could buy peanuts for instance there would be no that the, their 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 potential audience goes up and the people who have peanut allergies would love to not have them so it's a a lot of stakeholders all have sort of the same goal in mind which is to uh, imagine a world without food allergies. Yeah, and I would think that the allergists, uh, because of the research and everything, really want to be a part of this and and contribute as, as well. Uh, so let's kind of go into the government affairs area here and advocacy area. So what are your current uh, congressional priorities? And by the way, I think you had a nice win. Was it was it fast fastest? What, what, <laughs> yeah, the faster what was the act. Faster. Uh, yes, faster. It was an acronym like every single bill in the universe. Absolutely. And I won't I won't bore folks with what it actually was. But what it what it did was uh, mandated the labeling of sesame as the ninth major major food allergen. And I'll tell you why that's important and why it was it was exciting for our constituency. 
So as of before, there were eight, there were eight top allergens that were required to be labeled. Uh, sesame was not among them. Sesame was the ninth most uh, common allergy at one and a half million Americans suffered from it. So that meant when I say suffered from it, I meant one and a half million people, were they to ingest it either knowingly or accidentally because of it not being labeled, could go into anaphylaxis and die. Uh, and, and, and before this bill was passed, uh, sesame was, by the way, sesame is in almost everything. It's in Cheetos. It's in every, anything you can think of. You'd be surprised. It's, it's in the food. And usually it would be under natural flavorings or spices. So in, uh, people that were making food would just put that on there, right? That would be the proprietary blend. What makes our food taste so good? It happens to have sesame, but because we're not required to call that out, it's harder for people to basically protect themselves. So we got that bill uh, introduced in the last Congress, got it to the final, got it passed House and Senate uh, in, 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 one, in one session, uh, and ha- unfortunately had it die on the floor as, uh, uh, you know, I think about 40 other bills were waiting for unanimous consent at the end of the year, and there was a bit of a traffic jam there for reasons. Luckily, we got it reintroduced and passed in the first 100 days of President Biden and signed into law. Um, so re- like just almost got it in one session. So I still, in my mind, it was like one, basically one session, right? Well, we're going to call it that. But yeah, so that was that was a big win for the community. I think a big change. It had been, you know, stakeholders have been working on sesame labeling for years and years and years before I got to uh, FAIR. There was lots of work uh, with other food allergy organizations, with places like Center for Science and the Public Interest, who are working with the FDA to get citizens' petitions uh, written and try to figure out a way to get that done. And uh, legislation was the way that it happened to, to go, and, and FAIR was... The group leading that, so that was our big win. Yes, I'm glad, happy, always happy to talk about a win uh, that we've experienced in the last couple of years. So, well, I, I think that's great. And by the way, I now know that I don't have a sesame allergy because if it's in Cheetos, <laughs> I, 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 I would be like laying on the floor right now, maybe. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so that's good. To, that's good to know. And and your explanation is is quite spot on uh, with that because it's very difficult for people uh, with any type of allergy issue. Uh, to figure out exactly, you know, truth and labeling. Uh, right. As I had a family member that was uh, that had created a food product and was telling me the workarounds of how they deal with different labeling, and, and not because of allergies, but just because of uh, uh, you know how many calories are in something. How do you get around? How you position that to where people look at it and see the number and go, oh, great, fine, no problem. Right. You know, you know this, that all of those things, all of those regulations and laws that exist that that influence industry, there are people that are well paid whose job it is to figure out how to not violate them, but get the get the closest to what they want to have happen around them. Uh, they're, they're paid well to figure out how to dance around those things. So that is certainly that's that's true in this, this space as well. And all this is controlled through the uh, the USDA, isn't it? FDA. Well, as far as, as, far as yeah, FDA. Yep. Yeah. FDA. I'm sorry. Uh, but with the food product, though, that would be USDA, wouldn't it, as a uh, final product, or or is there a blend between the two of those? There's a blend. Uh, there are there are I think three agencies that that touch the uh, of elements that could have an allergen in them. Uh, uh, there are allergens in alcoholic beverages, so ATF, uh, USDA with food. There's a there's an allergy called alpha gal, where someone can be bitten by. Well, this is not to say labeling for for red meat, but you can be bitten by a tick. And then all of a sudden be allergic to red meat, which is something I certainly would not want to have happen. And it's a, it's growing, it's growing exponentially right now. It's a big, it's a big concern in the, in the allergy yeah. industry. Uh, and then FDA is managing all the sort of the packaged foods um, that are sold ahead of time. So yeah, the, the FDA uh, are labeling is, is, a, is a big area of concern for us. As far as legislatively, it's not as much because um, it's just the fact that we were able to get sesame changed on label I don't believe we thought was going to happen in one session or even really two. I think it's been a, such a long slog that the industry is, uh, you know, they're not, they're not a fan of additional labeling changes. They have labeling changes for a bunch of different things. And for them, it's about harmonization and making sure that they're not having to go back and change on pack labeling every six months because of the expense that that occurs. So that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's their concern. But as far as the, the patient side, there's precautionary labeling, which you might be familiar with is sort of like the, uh, it sort of says this food may contain said allergen. And the challenge is that there's, I think there's, I think we did a, a survey on this. There's almost 90 different versions of that statement. Uh, none of them mean anything different. None of them are more safe or less safe than the other. It's basically just phraseology, whatever they want to put on there. 
uh, to try to indicate that there might be something in there that you could be allergic to. The challenge is that the, that the, the food allergy community weighs them differently. So they, they make risk assessments based on that language and assume that this means this is more safe than this. Uh, X is better than Y when they're the same. So it's, it's, it was a really, it's a confusing situation that we, FAIR is trying to work with industry, with FDA, with other sort of third-party partners that work with uh, on-pack labeling to try to figure out how to standardize what it should say. What is a good thing to say that indicates that this food might actually contain the thing that you're allergic to and how you, how you should proceed. So that's not a legislative ask, but that is certainly something that FAIR is focused on well, for a while. And, and, and that would be, and not to make the, the connection uh, with the same issue, but what you're talking about is like the standardization labeling that would go on tobacco, as an example, where it says, warning, this may cause blah, blah, boom. It's standard. You have to have it. has to be on everything. I think it, I think it would be great if it could be standardized for all products, even if you shot a couple of years out and said, hey, listen, by this date on and this time, you know, all the labeling has to be changed. It gives them cycles to be able to change that packaging and that, that labeling. Yep, so, it's important. So other than what sure. we've been talking about, uh, are there any other major congressional priorities that you have right now that are, that are on the table? Yeah, right now we're working very hard on child nutrition reauthorization which is something that I'm sure a lot of people are working on. It has not been able to have been actually reauthorized in a new way, I think for two different times. So we're on sort of a continuance here. It hasn't been changed for 10 years. Uh, so what we're looking to do there is add food allergy training requirements to food handlers in the schools. So if you, th if you look at the, the, the issue is this basically, that there are the number of children on Medicaid continues to go up every year. There's a strong correlation between requiring government assistance for Medicaid and also being on free lunch. So if you're, if you're likely to get all of your meals or a large bulk of your meals at school, it's important to make sure that you know that they're safe. The other challenge is that if you're on Medicaid, you're one-tenth as likely to be diagnosed with a food allergy as you would be on private insurance. There's a lack of understanding and, and education around food allergies. There is a lack of allergists who's taking maybe potentially take Medicaid in, the, in your area. It's a challenge to get a diagnosis and to know that. And 25% of all first-time food allergy reactions happen at school and to people that didn't know they had it. Obviously, that's sort of the way you find out you have an allergy is to go through the horrible experience of anaphylaxis. So we were looking, we've been continuing to look at ways to raise the floor of safety up in different places. In the past, epinephrine auto-injectors were the big thing, making sure that they were in schools, making sure that they were available uh, potentially in, in public places like movie theaters and restaurants. That's, a, that's obviously state issues, but that's the whole, the premise is how do you create an environment, a, a, a higher floor of safety for people who know that they have food allergies and people that are discovering for the first time that they've had food allergies. But back to school, the idea is how do we make sure that if a child has to eat free lunch, because that's, that's, that's what they're on, that's, that's the way they get their, their nutrients at, at school, how can we make sure that the people that are handling their food can recognize what a food allergy reaction looks like, understand what cross contact is between allergens and how they have to handle and isolate certain, certain ingredients for kids that have that, uh, that, that thing that they're talking about. Uh, and we think that this is an easy way to do that. There's, there's a lot of precedence for other, other training required at the state level for food allergies, but that is an area that we're working on right now in the Senate and the house to try to sort of socialize that idea and get people to understand that this is something that can be done. Um, and it will not, there's no, there's no real cost to it whatsoever. They're already re being required to get, be trained on a number of food safety handling things. If you think about just what you're able, what you're required to do, be able to serve lunch at schools. Yeah. Um, this is just an element of, of safety that we think would make a big difference. Or, or for that matter, not just schools, but any food handling anywhere as someone who does an awful lot of speaking and spends a lot of time in hotels, as well as convention centers, uh, uh, speaking at conferences, you know, there's always the deal of uh, having the food handlers know, particularly if you're sitting at the table and you say, does this contain X, Y, or Z in it? And half the time the food handler has no clue. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I think the real problem, I think for, so there's two, I would say there's two buckets of things that we don't really get to touch as much from a food allergy advocacy perspective, or from, from my perspective as a, the house lobbyist for the organization. People care intensely about restaurants because that's what they're going out into restaurants. They want to feel safe. They feel like they're not heard. They feel like there isn't enough information and there's not enough training. Universally a state problem, right? That's, that's something that requires so much. It's so, it's so subjective. 
really, if I'm being candid, it's it's very uh, subjective on how the restaurant association in that in that state feels about that kind of regulation. So, in a lot of states, that there's a there's a really good relationship between the NRA and the state state legislatures because that's just it makes sense that the major industry driver for the state. So there's a there's a good give and take and communication from that. So from an advocacy perspective, I would love to work on that more because I think people want better training. They want more disclosure on menus. They want a lot of things, but those things are all state. And then the other thing is the labeling that we talked about. That's, that is, you know, we, like we, <laughs> I'm going against what I just was able to do last, last session and, and get faster act back. But in generally, like that is, that is a, a, a slow process that is collaborative with the FDA to get that kind of thing, because the FDA doesn't want to get ahead of industry on these major required changes. No matter who, whenever, no matter the administration, the FDA is a deliberative body when it comes to those kind of things and, and regulation, they're not in a hurry. So that's the, that's the struggle, I think, from, from FAIR's perspective is that we know what people want us to work on. And those are things that, you know, are, are, are a little bit, they're a little bit more labor intensive. We're a staff of three. So as far as being able to be in every state capital and work on those things, we're sort of diminished. But I wanted to also say for, from, a, from the federal priority perspective, uh, we're also trying to get food allergy training uh, to WIC coordinators. So sort of same premise about Right. Uh, that uh, sort of uh, access and inclusion for, for folks that are going through utilizing these government services, making sure that they're 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 being taken care of. And then there's two pieces of legislation that we're working on. Uh, uh, Del- Dylan's law, which is a Rep. Grothman bill, which is about making sure that states uh, provide training for people to administer epinephrine auto injectors in an emergency. So really, it's about uh, it's sort of like a good Samaritan backup law. Most of the cases, if you look at the number of lawsuits that have been brought about because of epinephrine auto injectors being administered incorrectly or causing injury or wrongful death, ex- exceedingly rare, very, very rare. There's nothing in the last 15 years that I've seen that's actually been caused by that, but there's still skittishness on both stocking epinephrine and administering it because people don't want to get sued. And this bill would provide grant funding to provide educational opportunities for people so that they don't have that. Don't have that concern. And the other bill uh, is the Allergy Act, which is a bill that addresses food allergy bullying, which is which is an epidemic, if you can believe it. Um, if you watch late night television or movies, food allergies are often the butt of the joke. It's it's an easy it's an easy laugh about uh, giving someone that's allergic to peanuts a peanut butter sandwich. It's just it's sort of like lazy and hackneyed at this point. But all, but that trickles down to sort of. Uh, well, kids will pick on anybody for anything. That's sort of the nature of, that's the unfortunate yeah. nature of uh, uh, childhood in schools. Uh, but the challenge there is when it crosses the line over into menacing and, and creating a dangerous situation where they're waving a sandwich in their face or milk or whatever it is that they're allergic to because kids don't really understand. And they really need the teachers that are around them to understand that this is what we need to do to both you know correct the problem when it happens, but also educate that this is not a joking matter. This is a serious thing and you need to treat people. And that same sort of story yeah. there. Well, and, and, and I have, I have a nephew that has uh, diabetes and he gets picked on because of that. And it's, it's the same kind of thing. And, and how do you, how do we do the best we can to protect them? So let's kind of spin here a little bit and go towards a fair host, uh, a legislative fly-in. Uh, you called it courage at Congress. That's the first thing I want to know is <laughs> why did you come up with a name courage at Congress that was held in March of 2021? Uh, uh, where did that name come from? So that name, uh, it's, it's funny now, I think we're probably going to have to change it. It came from, it came, well, for, for a number of reasons, but it came from, uh, uh, it was an, it was a national branding campaign that wasn't related to advocacy. And we wanted to sort of have that unified thread through all of our messaging. Uh, but now we don't, to use it anymore. So, so it doesn't really have a leg to stand on. We're going to have to, we're going to have to rebrand, but yeah, that was a great fly. And you know, I think if you ask, I think you could probably ask a bunch of people on the Hill who were doing fly-ins in March of that year. They're all said that they were the last ones to do it before everything closed down. I contend we are the last ones to do it before everything closed down. I think we were, we shut the lights out on the way out. We closed it down. Uh, our, our advocates came in uh, and had their meetings flew out and then uh, COVID shut down DC for an extended period of time. So that was your 2020 version. In 2021, you did a virtual version. We did. We did. Yes. And, and, and so how did, how did uh, in normal terms of managing a typical fly-in versus the virtual fly-in, we know very different components, very different ways of doing that. How did your numbers compare? 
uh, between the previous years? Yeah, no, I think the it's a double-edged sword. I think it's easy to get numbers, names on a sheet for a virtual fly-in. It's much harder to get the buy-in and time commitment for a multi-day event for a virtual event. So we had, uh, you know, 350 people sign up to do the virtual event, which is much more. We had 150 for the in-person event. Obviously, the costs are different, but they could do it from home in their pajamas from the from the from the waist down. Anyway, it was a great situation from that perspective. But we had a, a challenge, sort of making sure that people showed up to their meetings, right? Like you can have pre-work, you can explain to them that it's very important that they show up to these meetings, uh, that there are legislative staff uh, waiting for them. Uh, but sometimes people just don't show up because something kind of came up or they forgot or whatever else. It's a lot easier when you have someone in a room to have their attention and make sure that they're going to do sort of the things that they, they want you to do. So there, there are there are no doubt challenges. We can get at all of them. There are lots of challenges with, with the digital event, but I think that what FAIR is going to do going forward, and I bet that we are not alone in this, is that this is now going to be hybrid forever. Yeah. We're going to have in-person and, and virtual. And I think that's been the real big benefit about this is how do you increase your numbers? I mean, you make you double your work, but how do you increase your numbers and get people who would have not ever had a chance and time to advocate with you before and give them a platform and the tools to do so? It's a, it's a really great opportunity, I think. So that leads me right in because you said, how do you grow your numbers? So so how does FAIR grow your community of advocates? Because I would imagine you all you have new people constantly that are kind of coming into the fold. So how do you reach out and try to make them a part of your uh, advocate champions? Yeah, it's I mean, it's a challenge. It's, it's a bigger challenge than you would think because of the 32 million Americans. Right. I think there are people view their food allergies differently. So some people will not carry an epinephrine auto injector. They'll be like, it's not that serious. I'm not, it's not, I have a food allergy, but it's not my identity and they don't join fair. They don't do those things. So of the, I would say the total addressable market is substantially smaller than the, the 32 million of the 85 million. Uh, we have, it, it's a challenge about when you get them in. So if newly diagnosed, we have materials at allergist office. Allergists know to sort of send, send newly diagnosed families our way, right? We have, excellent reasons, probably the best resources on the internet for newly diagnosed, depending, no matter what your allergy is, telling you the next steps, what your life's going to be like, what you can do next, what are treatment options, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one avenue. Uh, there's patient registry, which is another avenue of, of allergists sort of sending people in. So the idea is that you share with us your, your information about your, what you're allergic to, uh, if you've tried to do any treatments, a number of reactions, all those elements that basically were able to aggregate and, and DNA, make it anonymous. <laughs> I can never say that word. Can't do it now on a podcast or without being on a podcast, uh, but make aggregate that data in a way that makes it useful and, and valuable from a clinical perspective, from a research perspective, from a pharmaceutical perspective. Um, so that's another avenue in. And then, you know, just conventional acquisition of, of new leads social media, email targeting, um, around issues that pop up, trying to sort of uh, center ourselves, not center ourselves in the story, but like figure out a way to take an angle on a story uh, that shows what FAIR can do to solve the problem and how you can, and how you can get in involved to be part of the solution. So I would, I would imagine like most people, like most groups. Okay, so let's walk through a quick scenario here. So let's say uh, that, you know, I acquire uh, an allergy and I, I come to you and I say, you know, you know, I'm part of your registry or I've gotten the material through my allergist, the doctor, uh, and I'm a part of your organization. And hey, I want to help. I want to speak out about this because this scares me. Uh, what do you do at that point to kind of indoctrinate them or help train them or help move them, let's say even from the 101 sure. up, a, up a little scale? How do you, how do you make them more influential? Yeah. We're, you know, the cool thing is that we're small enough that we're able to give individual one-to-one -one attention when that happens. So if we get an inquiry from you about how you want to get more involved and you want to speak out, I say, great, here are a bunch of ways. So become an advocate uh, for at, at FAIR, meaning, you know, join our email list. So you're getting all of our action alerts. Same again, Standard, standard move there. We've got a speaker's bureau. Are you interested in, in sort of being a media contact should there's an issue about food allergies in your town and we're looking for a, a person to have as a quote? We'll provide, you some, we'll provide you some media training. We'll give you some background and we'll keep you on a list for that. Do you want to attend a virtual fly-in or an in-person fly-in? 
we can do that. We have webinars, we have, we have uh, handbooks and like big, you know, multi-page PDFs that sort of tell you how to advocate um, sort of on your own, right? We have issue-based handbooks. So say most of the time people want to work on state stuff. And as I said, because we're unfortunately, because we're the, the size of our staff, um, we don't really get to do that. But what we do give them is handbooks on how to, how to run a bill themselves from the start to finish. So who do you go talk to? Sample bill language. How do you get co-sponsors? How do you prepare for testimony? How do you publicize your story? All those things that you re are required and, and, and need to do. Um, and unfortunately, because of the nature of, of, of the organization, like you have to sort of lead that ship yourself. But we made sure to create the resources that enable people to do that in a more robust way right off the bat. So that's, there are a lot of ways in, and then it's a matter of two, you sort of shake out. So you see what people actually do. So you, I think you get a lot of, you get a hot lead everywhere that says, I want to do 10 things. And then sometimes maybe they do two things, or maybe they do no things, or maybe they do 10 things, but you sort yeah. of have to, you have to react to that after the fact and then say, all right, well, you're really good at this. Maybe you want to be, so we have a, we have a grassroots leaders committee, which meets, every other month uh, to ba they basically get a higher level deep dive on what we're working on. What's the status on it? How can they get engaged? They want to have meetings. Great. We've got talking points for you on the things that we're meeting on. We can help you set them up. You can set them up yourself. Give us feedback on how this looks to you, to the community and things that are going on in your local area that you want fair to know about, even if we're not necessarily going to lead it in. So there's, there's different, like you said, there's 100, 100, 101 is get our emails. And then, and then it goes up from there to, to 301 where you're, where you're having your own meeting on your own. So that, you know, that, that reminds me yesterday, I was actually doing a virtual presentation to a group on advocacy. And, and I wrote a pocket guide called the seven actions of highly effective advocates. And I say to them, listen, they are actions. They're not steps. So you get to pick and choose whichever ones really fit you that you're going to stick with and do. So I heard you in your verbiage say it's whatever actions fit, whatever actions work, and, and do that. I must commend you to, to say that uh, I don't run into very many, there are others, but I don't run into very many organizations that have created a little bit of a speaker's bureau to be able to make sure that they're reaching out in the local community and then giving those people training. Uh, there is an organization that I do work with that I know that does that in a very effective way, and, it, and it's really telling. So, so let me ask you, because I couldn't find this out or relatively easily, let's put it that way. Are there, um, within FAIR, do you have state organizations as well of FAIR? So everything gets funneled to the top and then you trickle it down uh, that way. All right. So let's, uh, you have 10 years experience in digital advocacy. Is advocacy take technology kind of taking over personal grassroots? I think that's that is the question of the of the of the hour. With I think there's so many different uh, people in our space are bombarded. I'm sure on LinkedIn with articles about is the age of in-person lobbying over, and is this what is, what has COVID done to government relations and lobbying? And the truth, uh, my my general philosophy on all of this, both in the workplace and advocacy and all this stuff, is that in time we will get very very close back to where we were. I think that that's I think that's the end final state. In person lobbying will always be king. Uh, that that sort of being in the room, pressing the flesh, getting to actually see and look someone in the eye as they tell you their story and about how it affects uh, that policy that will never change. Zoom meetings can never compete. What technology does, in my opinion, is is lower the gates of entry to first time advocates and makes it makes that first leap into a potentially scary situation and scenario easier so that that's you get provides, to basic, them, provides them a safety net absolutely and i and that's been my one of my larger problems at at fair is that many people don't consider and this is probably not just fair it's probably everywhere people don't consider themselves advocates when they are quite clearly already advocates as a food allergy parent, for instance, you are advocating almost every day of your child's life. Uh, just because you're not speaking to a legislator does not mean you're not advocating. And because of that, there's a disconnect on what they can do and what they have done and, and where, where their talents are you know, sorely needed. So this technology element has enabled me to meet with and, and take people with me on legislative meetings that would have never come to DC. Uh, they would have never taken the time. They didn't have the money. They don't have whatever. Uh, and, and get into the scenario where they're like, oh, this is just, I'm just telling my personal story. They want to hear it. 
I feel like I'm making a connection. I feel like I'm actually making a difference. I want to do this again. And as an advocate, as a person who does this stuff, you're just like, this is why this is the entire reason we do this thing. This is, this is the positive reinforcement that makes everything worth it. So yeah. technology has improved that exponentially, but I think that on the whole, uh, we're going to probably be much like we were prior to, to COVID here in a couple of years. Yeah. And, and, and I think depending on how you're using technology, and I think depending on uh, the type of technology, I mean, right now, thank goodness we had Zoom. Thank goodness we were in a position to where we would, were able to do a lot of virtual and make it easy on people to do that. But there are other tools out there that in some regard, I think are creating an awful lot of noise. And I think at some point, uh, there's going to be the sifting through of those because while it creates the noise, while it gives people the ability to say, oh, look at my numbers, we did X, did they really move the needle of why they were there to do it in the first place? In other words, are we really being effective enough to get a piece of legislation passed, to change a piece of legislation, to kill a piece of legislation that's, that's uh, against uh, our issues and our cause, you know, and I think that I think all those things c come together. And I think there's noise out there. I think the volume of that noise is going to get a little bit higher before it gets better. But I yeah. agree with you. Eventually, we're, we're going to get back to we all need the human connection and we all need that one on one. And I, I want to look somebody in the eye that's telling me their story and telling me uh, how it affects them, because, you know, that that becomes the old Ronald Reagan. Well, I got a letter from Johnny the other day, right. kind of a thing, and and makes a difference. So the I, I think I you know I think faster is a good faster is a good example of this too. And if you look at the work of Congressional Management Foundation and, and a bunch of other groups that sort of talk about what's effective in, in advocacy, so many of those numbers and metrics you talked about are really only valuable internally. For your own your own evaluation, your boss cares what your reach was. Your boss cares about emails delivered, but if you've worked in the space long enough, you know that the level of engagement you have to have on a lot of issues, not all of them, but the many of them, you have to have such high numbers. If it's just grassroots digital stuff that's, that's getting you co-sponsors, you have turned the fire hose on in a major way that 99% of organizations cannot do by themselves. So faster is a great example. Like we're, our email list is not huge. Our email list is very, is, is large, but you know, for, for the size of the organization, but you know, our success was not necessarily grassroots online driven. It was the in-person meetings that we were able to have. It was the personal connections that people were able to form and utilize with their local legislators to, to get them to sign on and, and you know, other grass tops uh, methodology. It was not just hit the button and go send emails. That's not what got the bill passed. So, so with that, do you, do you keep track of who knows who, who knows who? Yeah, I think we are, we're, we're now evaluating a, a tool that will make this a little bit better versus sort of the uh, uh, institutional knowledge element that I think a lot of organizations have about those sort of connections. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're small enough that we know a lot of those stories for our individual grass tops, but we are looking at sort of trying to find a, a platform or solution that makes it a little bit easier, which there are plenty of, as you know. Yeah, absolutely. So as we're coming kind of towards the close, let me ask you, What's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the word advocacy? I think it is uh, a person feeling connected to change in their own life. I think it's, I, I, I sort of alluded to it before, and it's the reason that I've been doing it for the 10 years that I've been doing it and not, and not sort of straight away from patient advocacy or direct advocacy like that. It's the transition of a person coming from sort of this, from a, from a neophyte scared. I don't think I have a, a, a voice in this. I don't think it really matters what I do or say. I'm just this guy from this place and who cares? I don't have money. And then getting them to the, getting them in the, in the door and talking in front of an ad in front of a legislator or their staff and having them come out and feel alive with the, their own ability to impact change. So for me, adv advocacy is being the getting to getting to play the conduit for people to realize their own power and, and make change in their own life. And don't you think that that point is kind of the ignition point? Because when I think genuinely people that have never done this feel they're not really going to listen to me. And then they go in 
and the staff listens and it's taking vital notes. And if the member is there and uh, the elected official is sitting in the room with them and starts asking questions and cares about them and, and mentions them and speaks out about that and says, you know, yeah, co-sign that bill now or whatever. These people come out of there like with their hair on fire at this point. This is real. It does work. It it happens. And and that's kind of when the, the hook gets set. Yeah. Every one of your grass tops advocates had a good first meeting. Yeah. And they had they had a staffer who took notes. They had a staffer who followed up and, and said, you know, I heard your story about this. It was it, it moved me. I talked to my boss. I'll let you know where this gets. And then they follow, and then they actually follow up and become a co-sponsor. And that person is now going to be hooked because it's obviously if they've taken the time to come to DC and do this, this is an issue of that matters more to them than anything usually themselves right. or their child. And then it happened. And then they made an impact. And then they're like, oh, this is, I'm, I don't make this impact on anything else in my own personal life that quickly and that directly. And here it is right there. So all of the people that you have later on down the line in positions of leadership from a volunteer perspective had that first meeting. And as an advocacy professional, you are creating those down the line. Every time you have a fly-in, every time you set up a virtual meeting, you're creating the possibility for you to have that that super powered advocate in a few years down the line because of what you're doing. So that's a that's something I think that's good to remember as your fly-ins are stressful, coordinating all these meetings are stressful. You don't always know necessarily how it's going to go, particularly with first-time advocates. Sometimes they fly, as you know, sometimes they fly off the handle and talk about things you don't want them to talk about. But in the end, best case scenario, you are getting uh, something that's going to help you accomplish your goals down the line. And they're going to be you get the you get the personal reward from that, but you also get the personal reward from seeing this transformation of an individual from a first time volunteer to a savvy advocate that can really uh, make it make a difference in their lives and other people's lives. You know, John, that was so well said that I think it's time and the perfect opportunity to end the show. I mean, when you have folks, when you have a great guest that articulates incredibly well, that knows their subject matter very, very well, that knows the area of their competence extremely well. You know, no wonder he has a new title today. Uh, So John, congratulations on that. And any final thoughts or anything you'd just like to add before we... uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, if you if you happen to have a food allergy or you're passionate about it or you have a friend that does, I encourage you to go to foodallergy.org, uh, check check the website out, check, uh, you know, join our join our list to be an advocate, email me personally, and I'll tell you how we can get you involved. Uh, and then also, if you like DC soccer, check out RFK Refugees. <laughs> always Can't always be selling, plugging, right? Always selling, that's <laughs> fabulous. Thanks very much. That wraps up our wonderful conversation today with John Hoffman, the newly minted Senior Director of Government Affairs at the Food Allergy Research and Education, known as FAIR. John, thank you. I couldn't be more pleased with today's show. All the best to you. Thank you, Roger. Let's face it, today's advocacy arena is just plain noisy. Organizations are stretched. You need every advantage to make sure your issue gets the attention it deserves and your voice heard. The RAP Index is the best way to do just that by finding your stakeholders' relationships and engagement power. Get past the noise. Know who your people know. Go to rapindex.com. That's R-A-P-Index.com. And tell them Roger sent you for a special offer. If you like today's podcast, head over to where you find your podcasts and subscribe to the Voices in Advocacy podcast. A big thank you to today's guest. I appreciate your time and the unwavering passion for advocacy you have. Well, that's it for this episode of Voices in Advocacy. Remember, you have the power to be an effective, influential advocate. Now go out and make it a better world. We hope you enjoyed today's Voices in Advocacy podcast and look forward to you joining us again next week. To learn more about Voices in Advocacy, 
go to our website, voicesinadvocacy.com.